Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Locker Room. On this Thursday, July 27th, I'm Alan Locker. And today I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by a true legend of stage and screen, the two-time Tony Award winner and three-time Emmy Award winner for her pivotal role as Maeve Ryan on ABC's groundbreaking soap opera, Ryan's Hope, actress Helen Gallagher. Helen made her debut as Maeve 48 years ago this month on July 7th, 1975, and played Maeve for 14 years until the final episode where she sang Danny's Boy. Joining Helen later in the show is her on-screen son, Dr. Patrick Ryan, played by the talented Malcolm Groom. So without further ado, please, please help me welcome the one and only Helen Gallagher to the locker room. Hi, everyone. Hi, Helen. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. I can't tell you how the fans have been asking for you since I started this show over three years ago. I know uh, the fans, like myself, want to wish you a happy belated birthday. Yes. Thank you. Um, I hear you... Uh, had a special celebration with your Wednesday night class? We had a birthday party. That's awesome. Uh, a lot of singing? Well, some. <laughs> what What's your favorite song to sing? Do you have a favorite? I can't think of any. You just love to sing? Yes. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, you taught for many years. What What is it about teaching that you love? The people. <laughs> I I hear that you you consider you know your students family. Oh, definitely, they are my family. If 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 somebody is watching right now and, and wants to go, you know, follow how you started out as a song and dance uh, actress, what, what would be the biggest recommendation you would tell them, the biggest tip that you would tell them? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> uh, that, pr uh, I think we've all heard it. Practice makes perfect, right? Well, it may not make perfect, but it certainly makes you better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I certainly agree. Um, I love the fact that you were born and raised and still live in New York. Talk about, growing, talk about growing up in New York. What was that like? Well, I grew up in the Bronx. And it was great. We had... We had... The, the streets were our playground. That's awesome. And Broadway was not far away from uh, the Bronx. No, it was a subway ride. <laughs> Do you remember your first Broadway, sh going to your first Broadway show? No. No. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, talk about your earliest memories of wanting to become an actress and what, what drew you to the theater world. Well, at first, I wanted to just be a dancer. My teacher was um, Viola Cruz, who was a chorus girl herself. And she, uh, she made me dedicated to the art of practice. And, and you switched from dance to, to song? I never switched. I just did both. Did both. 
I love that. Talk about are there are there any directors or fellow actors or mentors who have had a profound, I, I guess she was one of them, profound impact on your approach to acting in the performing arts? Well, I mean, it was all the people that I worked with, I always admired. And uh, I just, the way Uta taught made you love acting. Uta Hagen, correct? Right. What, what, how, how would you describe how she made you love it? Well, she didn't make you love it. She made you work at it. <laughs> <laughs> and you worked hard for sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> well, you made your Broadway debut in 1947 in High Button Shoes. Won your first. Yeah, that was a, uh, that was, uh, I made my, uh, uh, Debut in '44, in seven. Oh. Uh, what was it? In 1944. Yes. Okay. Wow. Um, and I believe you won your first Tony in 1952 for Pal Joey. Right. And your second Tony for the re revival of No No Nanette in 1971. What yes, What did? Yeah. You know, winning that first Tony, what did that mean to you? Well, I, I was never a great one for prizes. It was just the, the fact that uh, I was recognized as somebody that uh, exceeded in. Yeah. That was what was important to me. That nice to be recognized. Absolutely. <laughs> do, do you have a favorite stage role out of all of the stage roles you've done? Uh, I can't think of a favorite. They were always my favorite. They're, they're all your favorite. That makes sense. Um, I I have to tell you, I, I watched an amazing interview you did with Mike Douglas in 1979 this week. The, the interview was over 12 minutes and you were discussing theater and Ryan's hope and saying, I happen to like New York. Do you remember that interview with Mike? I remember nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. I've no, been reading... I've been reading Tom Lasanti's Ryan's Hope book, and there's some great, great stories in there that you and Malcolm share memories and, and all of the cast. Um, what do you remember? How, how did the role of Maeve come about on Ryan's Hope? It was always there. I mean, it was, it was designed around it uh, because uh, Bernie Barrow, who was my love in the show, my husband and my love. Yeah. Uh, he just, uh, he went to Ireland and that's where he met me. And that's when he decided he wanted to marry me. And how did uh, Claire Labine and, and Paul Mayer approach you about doing Ryan's Hope? Do you remember that? They didn't approach me. We approached them. Oh. A man named Howard Hoyt uh, had the idea. And uh, so that's, and I auditioned, and apparently they liked it. <laughs> they, they certainly did. They, they certainly, certainly did like it. Um, were, did you do you recall if you hesitated at all to do a soap opera? No, I didn't hesitate at all because I loved the idea of the part. What was it about Maeve that that made you want to play her? <coughs> all uh, that I loved was the, 
the fact that said she just gathered children around her. And I've always gravitated toward children. She she certainly had a large family, Maeve Ryan. <laughs> she, oh, she only had about seven, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just about that. Um, do you remember, you know, those early days to go from stage to the grind of a soap? Did you find it easy, difficult to do daytime? No, I didn't. I loved the, the part. She was just uh, the center of a very large, loving family. And that's what I always wanted to be. I wasn't, but. But playing that provided that. That's right. It became it. Yeah. It, it, it really did. Uh, you know, Claire and Paul created Ryan's Hope. Um, what were they like? You know, what was your relationship with both of them? Claire, I absolutely adored. She died too soon, as far as I'm concerned. She did, very much so. I, I worked with her briefly on Guiding Light. Oh, she was a wonderful lady. Absolutely. Well, and I think I, I read that she modeled Maeve after her mother and grandmother. I never heard that. I, I believe if I have that correct, I think she, that's sort of the inspiration. Um, sure the and I, I wanted to read uh, Damon Jacobs of We Love Soaps had interviewed Claire and she said the following about you. Helen sort of set the bar. We had kids to, uh, who had never been in a studio in their lives and had very little experience, even on the stage. Then we had our old timers who were a little bit cynical and who had been around the track a few times. And then Helen walked in with her two Tonys and the respect of everybody in the building and said, okay, I'm a song and dance girl and I'm here to do the job. Helen came in every morning prepared. She was fierce, fearsome to the kids that were not. And anyone who had a scene with Helen really paid attention. And that was a gift to us. She is a gift to the world. That is what Claire said in one of her interviews. Oh. Well, that's really kind. <laughs> um, what was it like? You know, was it different when Claire and Paul owned the show than when ABC owned the show? Did you find it different? Yes. I mean, when uh, when ABC took over, it was much more about timing and, you know, hitting the right notes and stuff. But uh, they, were, they were quite wonderful. That's, you know, reading the book, it, it, it came across the love everyone had for Claire and Paul. Um, do you have uh, some favorite story storylines over the years that you remember? Well, just the fact that they were loving, loving people. Mm -hmm. And they really loved family. And wrote family very well. Yes, they did. They, 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 they really, really, really did. Um, Damon, who, who had interviewed Claire, was also curious um, for you what it was like to go from Claire writing for your character of Maeve to the character on One Life to Live, the sex therapist, Dr. Maud. I don't remember that. <laughs> you did One Life to Live for a little bit, uh, and I think Claire wrote Dr. Maud for you. I don't remember it at all. You you mentioned Bernie that. Barrows. What? You, men you mentioned Bernie Barrows earlier, who played Johnny Ryan, your husband. Um, Loved him. <laughs> did you hit it off from the get-go? Yeah. Pretty much. 
we had a little disagreements about, you know, things. But uh, D- doesn't yeah. every husband and wife? <laughs> right. <laughs> Every husband and, and wife. Um, why do you think you two clicked so well and the audience loved Johnny and Maeve? Because we both had the same value of children. Life was about the children. It was. The, your lives on the, on the show centered around your kids. Oh, yes, absolutely. And boy, you had a talented, talented crew of actors playing those. And we'll talk about some in a minute. But Ryan's Hope was on the air for, I believe, about eight months when you won your first Emmy for playing this role. What what do, do, do you remember? I mean, that must have been, I know uh, you said accolades aren't important, but, you know, here's a new show on television and then to be recognized by a new community must have, must have been a nice icing on the cake. It was indeed. And, and, and then to get two more for playing a character you loved. I loved what she loved, children. Where did your love of children come from? Were you always drawn to kids at a young age? Yes, pretty much. From the Bronx, you know. Play, playing on the streets of, of the Bronx. That's right. Yeah, surrounded, right? Surrounded by that. Totally. Well, of, of all the actors who have played your son, you know, over the 13 years... What was it about Malcolm Groom that made him so special? His personality. He was just a very human. Uh, not just an actor, but he he added his humanity to it. Which is really important, isn't it? Oh, it's everything. Com- completely. Well, without further ado... Let's bring out Mr. Malcolm Groom to join you. All right. Hey, Malcolm. Hey, Ellen. Hey, Helen. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. Thanks for the I, kind words. I got my humanity from my, my TV ma. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Speak about, you know, um, you know, coming to Ryan's Hope. Well, first of all, how did how did the role of Pat Ryan come to you, Malcolm? Well, um, first of all, uh, I had uh, they had me auditioning for the role of Bucky, which was Pat's best friend, and uh, I did that. And then when they called me back for a screen test, they gave me the the lines for Pat, and uh, so then they offered me the role, and I, I actually turned it down the first time because I I was doing a lot of theater, and I wasn't sure about doing a soap and then it came back again and I rethought it and I thought yes and then when I heard Helen Gallagher was playing my mother I thought hey no doubt about it I'm coming up on board for that I, I love that I love that I love that talk about you know on one side Helen Gallagher the other side Bernie Barrows you know talk about them as your parents as your you you know I read in the book both of them were were dear friends and to this day which really says so much about I think what Claire and Paul created with the show that you're still friends here we are all these years later. Well, it really was. You know, Helen was talking just a little while ago about family, and uh, I felt like we had a real family there. I I felt like you, Helen, were my mother in spirit, you know, that, uh, there was a really strong mother son connection between us. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I probably uh, projected, you know, a lot of that on you, but I really felt so close to you as a mother figure in my life. That was on one hand, 
on the other hand, we were coworkers and friends. So it was a, a nice blend. And uh, that, that was the most amazing thing about Ryan's Hope was the family aspect. And it wasn't acted. It was real. There was a, a tight group of people. There was Nancy Addison and um, Eileen Kristen, Kate Mulgrew, of course, Bernie and Helen. And uh, we were just a very close group. Uh, we, we did things together outside of the show, and I went to, to Helen's country house a couple of times and had a beautiful time. And uh, yeah. yeah, and I heard you you went to Bernie's as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I, Bernie's out in Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. So yeah. I and, love uh, that. Well, Helen. Speaking of Kate Mulgrew, she played your your daughter. Um, what? Do you remember about working with Kate? Oh, I loved working with her. <laughs> That's what I remember. She, her, her character Mary was quite popular. Her, uh, I'm blanking on her boyfriend's name. Um, blanking on it. One of the fans will. Jack Finelli. Yeah. Jack Finelli. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Um, Yeah. Did, and for you, Malcolm, did you did you all sort of see that Kate would go on from there? Did you feel it working with her? She was very impressive. She, her technique was impeccable, and uh, she had a lot of drive, a uh, lot of uh, you know good ambition. And I don't think any of us were surprised when when she excelled the way she did. Hmm. Uh, Helen, Malcolm, talking about you as as you know uh, a surrogate mom per se, were were your were your Ryan children your surrogate children? Helen, what? Oh, I wasn't sure if you heard me. The um, as Malcolm was saying, you were like a surrogate mom to him. Were were the Ryan kids surrogate children to you? They were friends. Friends. Very good. strong friends. I love In that. Uh, Malcolm, I was going to ask, did you ever get the honor of seeing Helen on stage? Uh, yeah, quite a few times. <clears throat> I think the, the first thing, you remember you did uh, Gingerbread Lady somewhere out in Long Island, the Neil Simon play, Helen? Well, I remember, but I don't remember. Oh, uh, okay. Kathy Tolan played your daughter in that. Remember Kathy? Yeah, Kathy was a very dear friend of mine. Yeah, and, and I saw you together in that play. And then I saw um, Tallulah a number of times. Um, it, it was at Westside Arts. And also, um, Wynn Hanson had you do a workshop presentation of it at American Place Theater. I saw that. So I saw it in its various phases as Helen was developing uh, that character. You were just marvelous in it. You were, you were like personifying Tallulah Bankhead. Uh, I don't know. Did you ever meet her? I think you had met her, right? Tallulah. Oh, yes. Really. Mm -hmm. She was a very impressive. I bet. I bet. <laughs> You you must have worked with some incredible people on stage, Helen. I have. Some incredible. Well, um, one of your Ryan's Hope co-stars, Michael Corbett, who I don't believe, Helen, you you had much scenes with. He was young. Uh, he played Michael Pavel Jr. on Ryan's Hope. I just interviewed him last week, and he regrets not telling you what it meant seeing you do no 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 Nanette. So I'm gonna play a clip that he wanted to say to you. And you can tell her that I probably learned more my very in my very beginning by watching her because she just I mean first of all and I never got to you know I never will you tell her the story because I never have told her this. Um when I Growing, you know, I forget what it was. I saw her do a production of No, No, Nanette. She was an amazing Broadway performer. And I came on the show and I, I never, the entire time, I never got to tell her how much I respect her for being a Broadway musical theater person. 
but I would watch her and she was just so specific and so direct and knew what she was doing. So I would, I learned from watching her in Ryan's bar. Um, we never had story together, uh, but I would always watch her cause we were, you know, it was a small cast, her and also Louise Schaffer was another one that I learned so much from because I was a, a, you know, a kid and watching those two veterans, um, really helped me, uh, help my work ethic and the discipline and also their way of like, they were, they were on it. They, they knew their stuff and they were just very specific all the time. So please share that story with me. <laughs> I mean, you must have heard that a number of times. I, I can't imagine, uh, you know, knowing how many young artists started on Ryan's Hope, watching you, Helen, do what you do so beautifully. Malcolm, can you talk about working opposite Helen and Bernie and, and what you learned yourself from their experience? Yeah, well, first I want to say he was mentioning No, No, Nanette, and that was the first time I saw you, Helen, was you getting your Tony Award on television for No, No, Nanette. And I remember you being just so heartfelt and emotional in receiving it. And I remember your hair specifically. You had, you had a haircut that when you turned your head, the whole, it just like waved. I don't know if you remember that haircut, but it was it was famous. It was like, <laughs> yeah. And then working with Helen, um, one of the things, Helen was so specific in her physical life in terms of activities. Like whenever she had a scene, she insisted on doing everything very meticulously, like in the kitchen. She would be making the stew. She would be uh, you know, uh, boiling the water. She would be making tea for people or delivering scones. And it's like uh, the physical activity was the life of the character. And then, then the lines were not played as lines. They were like real life coming out while she was living her life. And that, that's one of the things I, I learned from watching Helen, a very major thing of of having a real life on stage and, and being, um, having, having tasks that you're doing, which is what we do in real life. We don't sit there and deliver lines to people. We live our lives. And, uh, so, so that's one of the main things I learned from Helen besides her, her incredibly deep emotional life, which affected everybody around her. When we were playing a scene, you were so grounded, Helen, that it helped us all be grounded. That it helped us all realize that uh, that humanity that we were talking about. Playing a scene with Helen was like nothing else. It was always my favorite things to do, like to, to hang out in the kitchen while you were doing something, and I'd be sitting there at the at the counter, and you would be, uh, you know, would be having some heartfelt scene. But um, those were some of my favorite scenes with Helen were, were the kitchen scenes, Ryan's kitchen. I love that. Um, Maeve spent a lot of time in the kitchen. Helen, did you over the years spend a lot of time in the kitchen? Was a kitchen a favorite spot for you at home? Yes. <laughs> at home, yes. Are you a good were you a good cook? Not particularly. <laughs> I bet I bet Maeve was. Yes, Maeve should have been. <laughs> <laughs> she had a lot, she had a lot of mouths to feed for sure. Absolutely. Um, there were some fans, Roy and Wanda and many others, were asking, Helen, did you ever tire of singing Danny Boy? No. And none of us ever tired of hearing it either. I, I bet. I bet hearing that beautiful voice on stage must have been a gift every every time uh, she opened her, opened her mouth. Um, but it must have also been really hard singing it in the last episode. Do you do you remember? Why to cry? Yeah. Fans talk about that to this day. They bring it up all the time. Uh, hearing you, you know, talk about that. Uh, Malcolm, did you have a relationship with Claire and Paul? You, uh, yeah, uh, we all did. And, um, 
Yeah, like Helen said, I, lo I loved Claire and like you got from the book. I didn't realize that book was out yet. It's now, not. I'm, I'm reading it now in advance. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought Tom would you know. Um, <laughs> Which so, was really um, helpful. I keep freezing. Yeah, um, you can't really see it, but there it is. Um, oh. I, it, it's been very helpful. I didn't know I would uh, get to read it now, but uh, yeah, some great information in there. You know, talking yeah. about how how you were all such tight knit uh, family members. Mm -hmm. And what did Claire you love was, about Dr. Ryan, playing Dr. Ryan? Um, well, uh, what did I love about I loved I loved the storylines they gave him, all the storylines with Delia in the very beginning. The very first uh, scene, Claire had written this, it was like a three or four page speech uh, where I was talking about an Irish myth of the River Shannon and talk, talking to faith and it was poetry. And that, that's one of the things that Claire was so good at. She was a poet. Her scripts would be just full and poignant and uh, full of metaphor and beauty. And uh, that, that's one of the things with Claire, she, had, she was like a force of nature. She'd come in the room, she was larger than life and she was a, a tall woman anyway. Yeah, I was going to say, she was like six something, right? Or five eleven, or... Like it, yeah. And yeah. she would come in the room, and the room would be filled with her energy and her enthusiasm, and whatever she would be talking to about a storyline, you would get so excited about it because she was excited about it. So, uh, yeah, you asked about how I, how, how I felt about Claire, and it was totally an admiration of her. And it's Paul was her host, so, you know... Paul was kind of, he wasn't quite as major in, in that creative force, but he was her support and, uh, you know, uh, would, would bounce things off of her. And uh, so together they were a great team. Um, one of the fans, Travis, said that Mary's death is one of the most shocking moments in daytime soap history. It you was. <laughs> It must have been hard, hard to play that. Very hard. And hard to lose uh, the character from the show. Yep, it was. In fact, they wanted to get uh, uh, one of the girls that I was very fond of, and I can't think of her name. Terrible. I have no memory at all. To replace to replace her? Yeah, to you to oh, step was, that in. was that Kathleen Tolan? Because she yes. played Mary. No, she didn't. She didn't take it. I told her not to. I said you'll never make it. <laughs> she would it was too hard for her, you thought? No, it was just too hard for them to replace Mary. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. A popular, this, a popular character like Mary. And Kate was so strong in the role. I, I, I think it was hard for anybody to come up to that level after that. Although there were some talented actresses. They had three or four, I think, that played Mary over the years. And then finally, I think it was... Um, Nicolette Goulet, is that her name? I think that is Nicolette Goulet. Yeah, Nicolette Goulet. They killed her off, and I wasn't on the show then. I had left the show, and then I came back later. But I, I wasn't there for Mary's death myself. But I watched it. Did you watch after leaving? Oh or yeah, I, yeah. I followed it. I followed it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. What? What was? Were you there uh, for the final? I can't recall. Yes. But, and for for the cast listening to Danny's Boy for the last time, what was that like? It had to be emotional. It was, yeah, Helen was very emotional seeing it. Whenever Helen was emotional, it would like be so, uh, there would be reverberations and depth to it. And 
<laughs> and we were all there listening, and it was a very poignant moment. And it felt like the whole history of the show was in that rendition of Danny Boy, that Helen embodied the whole, encompassed the, the entirety of Ryan's hope in that, that singing. In, in that three minute, in that three minute song per se, and and fourteen years of Ryan's hope, and they would have shots of each of us listening, and everybody was very full emotionally listening to it, and then Helen did something at the end. Uh, I don't know if you remember Helen. I think it was an ad lib. I don't think it was written. She finished the song and she said, "Have a nice life." And, no, and it was ad lib. Yeah, I yeah. live right, and and I felt like it was Helen's blessing to all the fans, to all the actors. That it was a, a blessing to we're gone now, but you, this is over. But you have a wonderful life, you know. And it was good and living, Helen. <laughs> it, was, it was perfect. It, it is, and a great great way to to sum up that that, for you know those fourteen years. Um, a fan was asking Malcolm if you had any thoughts on Faith Caitlin, who uh, who played Faith the first time. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he was asking about her being replaced. You know, right? That was hard. I knew Faith um, from doing repertory with her a couple of years before. In fact, I came into the show having worked with Nancy Addison and with Eileen in, in Greece on Broadway, and then Faith and I did repertory in North Carolina. So we were already very close and uh, had kind of a brother sister relationship. And it was, it was very hard to see her written off the show. Um, I don't think she understood why. I don't think uh, any of us did. And uh, I can't remember, who, oh, Nancy Barrett replaced her right away, I think. And then later it was Kathy Hicks and then um, uh, Karen Morris, Karen Morris Gowdy. And both I Kathy just, and- I just interviewed her. She's a great, she was great. Karen? Yeah, I interviewed Karen. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. She, she looked great. Um, you, you made me, uh, I blanked. Sorry. <laughs> oh, Nancy Addison. Helen, any memories of Nancy Addison and working with Eileen Kristen, who pr played Delia? I was very fond of both of them. <laughs> Eileen is a spitfire, isn't she? She is. <laughs> Still to this day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> from, yes. I don't think she's changed probably from the day she started on Ryan's to today. Right. A, a great and talented lady as well. Um, you, how do you think, you know, your time on Ryan's Hope shaped everything you did after? Like, did it have an impact on, on how you approached things afterwards? I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, not that oh, I know. Oh. Sorry, Helen, I didn't hear what you said. I said, I'm sure it did. Not that I have any, you know, memory of that. Right, right, right. And for you, Malcolm? Um, well, you know, I, th I felt like it was such great experience that I could take on. It was almost like, you know, I had, st I had studied uh, acting in college and then done a lot of theater, but it felt like it was a graduate school course and how to work with camera, you know? So I, I learned so much just about working uh, on a three camera basis and then fi on film in general. And so I was able to take that, that with me as a strong education. Mm. Good experience, yeah. Can you, you both talk about the blow, blowing up of Ryan's bar? I know how much it affected fans and also the original cast members and, and sort of it led to storylines that, you know, strayed from the actual core Ryan family. What, what, you know, probably, you know, you read it in a script or somebody told you that it was going to happen. What, what do you remember about uh, the blowing up of the Ryan's bar, Helen? I remember that it, it bothered me. A lot. And that, that was after Claire had left, is that correct? I don't remember. Malcolm, I would think so, right? Yeah. Claire, Claire never would have blown up Ryan's bar. Right. I, I didn't <laughs> think so either. 
Lions Bar was like the heart of, of, of the show. It was the heart center of the show, you know? And so when they blew it, blew it up, it, it felt like, and it was a different producer that had come in and wanted to shake things up and uh, put his own mark on the show. Um, but to us, it felt like they were destroying our family treasure, you know, the treasure of, of, the, of that beautiful Brian's bar. That That's where I think um, daytime executives don't understand that impact that that has, because most soap operas are about family and that bar held a special place, not only in the people who worked you know, played the Ryans, but in the every single fan of Ryan's Hope. Absolutely. They, they, um, they got a lot of flack and they, they ended up redoing the bar. It wasn't quite the same, but they rebuilt it. So we had Ryan's bar through the end of the show. Um, any thoughts on Nancy Addison? You, you mentioned doing stage with her. Fans were asking memories of Nancy. Helen first, or uh, either or. No, Malcolm did was on stage with right. You did a show with. I, I actually didn't do a show with her. We were in class together. We were in. Ah, an okay. That's how I knew her, and uh, we had a really close friendship even before the show started. And um, but that that was devastating when Nancy got sick. And in fact, uh, that was the last time I saw you, Helen, was at her memorial service. And it seems like just a few years ago, but I was just looking it up, uh, and it was 21 years ago that Nancy died. Wow. I, I believe and that I, it depends. She's never died for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Too young, another two. All the time. You think of Nancy all the time? All the time. I do too. I do too. Yeah, you know, it, I've done a, a few Ryan's Hope interviews, and I have to say, it's it's really lovely to hear that because I hear it from every single person. She really touched so many people's lives. Um, Christopher Durham. Um, oh, you're and, very close. Yeah, and somebody. Um, I know it was Karen. They were talking, but there was somebody else. But they all have her perfume they they wear her perfume or have a bottle of the perfume that she loved because it reminds them of her I, I thought that was really really special um malcolm it, it must must have been a nice feeling too you knew nancy before you knew eileen before to come in to a new environment and have people who you were you know comfortable with yeah it it, it felt uh like there was some security in that uh, yeah. I always have a bit of a problem approaching new situations, so that helps me ease into it. And then meeting Helen and Bernie and, uh, you know, having our, our seeing that our family was like forming their our TV family, uh, immediately that gave me a, a, a sense of security and kind of a, a comfort blanket, you know, in doing the show. Yeah. We were so excited when that show started. I, I, I think all of us had an excitement. It was set in New York. They, they shot scenes on the city streets. Uh, it pioneered so much. Um, Washington Heights, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Which they call yeah, Riverside. There, there's no soap opera that was, t you know, New York City as the backdrop. No, no soap opera that had a real city. I don't believe. Right. Uh, not until I think The Bold and the Beautiful was Los Angeles, many years later. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Yeah, they were all fictional towns. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's incredible. Um, also, your um, Andrew Robinson, who played Frank, you were really close with, right, Malcolm? Yeah, I See him and, and his, his wife, Irene, they live about a half hour away here in, well, more like 45 minutes. But uh, I saw them just a few months ago. We, we are still very much in touch. Andy and I became, we were play brothers on the show and, and we felt like brothers. We're still brothers. So 
I, yeah. I love that. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, when you do stage roles, both of you, um, you don't normally keep in touch with everybody, do you? Is that a Some typical? Sometimes Some of, we do. Some, sometimes. But here, here we are, you know, Ryan's Hope went off 89 and you're still, you know, as close with these people, you know, you may not see them every day, but you just said you saw Andrew. I mean, did you, you know, imagine that Ryan's Hope would lead to such beautiful friendships? Well, it felt like it during, um, during the show that, that they were enduring friendships, you know, uh, being established and uh, it, it definitely went on yeah, beyond the show. So I wasn't surprised. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's true very often when you do a, a play, you have a very close group, a family kind of forms immediately and then it disperses and some people you stay in touch with for a while. But well, Ryan's hope, because it went on for so long and went so deep with our emotional interplays, it, it established a, a stronger bond um, than, than just, you know, doing like a show for a couple of months or something. But I'll always feel so close to Helen. I love her deeply, as she knows. <laughs> Do you remember yes. meeting the first time? Uh yeah, well, the first time I saw her, I was getting her Tony for No No Nanette, but then uh, I I don't remember the specific meeting. I just remember, and I don't think we were had scenes the first day, because the first day they had all the characters, but they split it into two days of shooting, one in the hospital and one in the bar. But I remember when I saw Helen, um, I felt like she was kind of looking at me like... Uh, looking at me up and down, so you're supposed to be my son or something, you know, I'm like getting sized up. But immediately we fell into uh, a wonderful working relationship. And, she, uh, she probably was looking like you're going to have to earn this love. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> earn her respect as an actor anyway. I felt that, that I needed to, to really get my game up, you know, to be playing with this, uh, Iconic Broadway legend, Helen Gallagher. <laughs> Helen, do you remember, you know, um, those early days? Was there a excitement on the set of, you know, everybody wanting to do their best as you were launching a brand new show on, on a network? Yes. It was strange. <laughs> Must have been some pressure too, coming. Yeah. Everybody must have wanted, you know, was excited to be there and wanting to, you know, the show to succeed. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Do, and then um, Ryan's Hope lost its original slot to Loving which sadly affected the ratings and they moved your time slot to 1230 to make room for the hour long, all my children, I believe. Um, you know, what, what happened was we were at noon and then uh, loving came on and, and uh, Agnes Nixon creator of loving and all my children fought for that time slot for loving. And so we were, and she had a lot of clout with the network and we were pushed to 1230 and uh, a lot of the local affiliates had their news at, uh, at 1230 across the country. And so we, we lost so much of our, uh, of, of our market. And then, so, and the ratings started to be affected by that for sure. We lost viewership, lost a whole affiliates. Yeah. I mean, losing the support of the network or, you know, having them move you. Um, do you remember finding out that the show was being canceled, Helen? Oh, it was rumored long before it occurred because we knew that they were fighting for that time. They they wanted that time slot. Yes, they wanted a lunch. Yeah. It, it, it's awful. I mean, 
were you you all must have been kind of upset when Claire and Paul sold the show to the network too. No, I don't think I was, was upset by that. But, that, but I think they're, they're losing control of the show, probably. Right. That's what yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's hard. Yeah. That's absolutely uh, so difficult to go through. When you look back at your time and you think about those 14 years on Ryan's Hope, Helen, what, what immediately comes to mind for you? The family. Did, did you realize the impact Maeve had with fans? Well, to some extent, because we'd get mail. But not to the extent that they would. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Here we are. We're doing this interview. Um, like 20 years later and the fans, you know, the love is still there. It's really something. Years later, 30 years later. 30 years later. I know I was trying to do the math quickly in my head and I couldn't do it. Sorry. <laughs> I am definitely not a mathematician. <laughs> Hel Helen's character made was the moral center of the show. Yeah. I think fans related to that character as, as kind of an earth mother, uh, a moral center, you know. Well, one thing that was interesting about the show was the, the modernity coming in conflict with the, the moral code that uh, Johnny and Maeve had, because you have the, these Catholic, uh, beautiful, hu human, humanistic Catholics, but then you have these modern situations like Pat getting deal of, deal you're pregnant and that, that were horrifying, you know, to Maeve and Johnny. I remember those scenes just really, really strongly. Uh, uh, affairs after affairs. Yes, yes. And yes. so that rock boat, and I think as the, the show developed, I think Maeve's and Johnny's moral structure loosened up a little bit and became more accepting, you know, of just what was happening. That was my take on it. Um, do, you, do you think that might be true, Helen, that, that Maeve evolved during the show with those situations? Yes, definitely. Yeah, and 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 daytime soaps didn't really deal in, uh, you know, religious aspects on a large scale, but on they, a lot, on a small scale they did. They did, but Ryan's Hope certainly did. I mean, it was you know, I mean, major. It, it, yeah, it was launched with you you know an Irish Catholic family. I mean, for sure. Right. You know, that was what Claire and Paul set out to do. Um, and it, it, it is so interesting because I, I love that you say that, Malcolm, the moral center, um, you know, uh, daytime executives always think viewers want the younger audience and they don't. I mean, w watching a show, we relate to the mom and the dad so much and, and you know, fans really want to see Maeve and Johnny on screen. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the family dynamics, we all come from a family, whether it's a whole family or, dyna you know, family dynamics are what we all go through in life. Right, right. Uh, Tom Lasanti, who wrote the book, says Maeve was giving her famous tongue lashings to her wayward family and their partners, Delia, Jack, Ray, Joe, and Dakota. <laughs> Maeve definitely uh, told told people when they were out of line, didn't didn't she, Helen? Yes, she did. <laughs> she didn't hold back. Were there practical jokers on the set? Somebody who always cracked you up. That was Dickie Briggs. He was oh, the stage manager, Dick Briggs. Yeah. 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 You know, one of the, the most fun things was when was St. Patrick's Day when they would bring in 
Remember Helen, a woman named Vivian came in and would teach us uh, Irish jigs and, you know. The, oh, yeah. Did. She was a good jigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my favorite moments were, were doing the jig with, with Maeve. I and, love that. Yeah, I have strong memories of that. Yeah. Those, those were great. Talking about the Irish, that was the other side of the Irish Catholic was the Irish spirit that they brought to the show and even shot some of the show in Ireland with, uh, with uh, Kate and Jack. Yeah. So, yeah, and they were probably a, um, um, one of the first shows to go to Ireland, I would think. I don't think there's been many daytime shows that have gone. Rosaleo is watching. She said, Danny Kelly was a prankster. Oh. <laughs> Did I that? You Rose Aleo? Oh, oh, right, 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 yeah. right. Um, Did either of you watch repeats of Ryan's Hope when it was on SoapNet? No. I did. I, I taped them. I recorded them. Oh, that's yeah. great. I have a nice revisiting and, and, uh, cause I didn't have any of the original tapes. And so, you know, I'd be able to show some of my friends, Oh, this is what, what we did. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I watched it on SoapNet for sure. Oh my God. That's, that's terrific. This guy is. Oh, that's, I, I was wondering who was, who was chatting up. Oh, what's your cat's name? This is Otorongo. Oh. He's 17 years old. How many? Helen, 17. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Helen, what was the name of your black and white cat? I'm trying to think. Remember your, your kitty cat? Yeah, sure. I remember Bo and my Trouble was one. Trouble? Yeah. There was another one I knew. I can't remember her name. Biddy. What is it? Biddy. Oh, maybe. Mm -hmm. When I would visit you, I, the, the cat was, remember her very, very vividly. Were those the only animals you had, Helen? Cats? Cats, yes. Do you have yeah. any now, Helen? No, I couldn't get one after Biddy. It broke oh. my heart. Oh. oh, it's always heartbreaking to lose a um, pet companion for sure. Before yeah. I let you go, what do you think uh, Ryan's Hope's most enduring? Uh, what do you believe was the show's most enduring legacy? I don't know. I guess family. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would it always, say. It always comes back to that. You know, we keep saying that, but it's it's true. You know, I think people were very impressed with the family aspect. And people, if they didn't have a family, loved watching the show because it gave them that sense. It, right. Absolutely. Helen, many fans were asking, you just celebrated 97. What What is your... What is your... Uh, gift to a long life. What what do you attribute? My mother lived to 101. Wow. Uh, oh. Wow. Okay. You still got you still gotta meet her record. <laughs> yeah, you gotta beat it. Well it, it runs in the family then for sure. Genetics. Good genes. <laughs> Good genes. Well here here's to another 20 or 30. <laughs> oh <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> Helen, Malcolm, thank you so much. The fans, thank you so much for the for the gift of Ryan's Hope. And I thank you both so much for spending this time with me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Helen. It's wonderful to share this with you, Helen. And with you. Stay well. I stay, period. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great afternoon, you two. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Helen Gallagher and Malcolm Groom, for spending the hour reminiscing about their time on Ryan's Hope. Don't forget to order, pre-order Tom Lasanti's Ryan's Hope, an oral history of daytime's groundbreaking soap uh, that changed daytime drama with this in-depth, intimate, and entertaining cultural history in the words of its cast, crew, and creators. I am loving it, and I did not watch Ryan's Hope. The book will be released this November. Please join me tomorrow, uh, Friday, July 28th, when actor and businessman Jetty, J. Eddie Peck joins me live. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And as always, everybody, stay safe and have a great evening.